Good morning, good afternoon, good night, doctors from all over the world. My name is Julio Reina Farge. I'm here with a very special edition for our webinar from this weekend. And here I'm going to present you uh, uh, to Dr. Bishwas Bhatia, who is from India. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful webinar talking about implantology and periodontology. So uh, before I we we uh, let Dr. Bish was uh, tell us a little bit about his his work and how he decided to be a dentist in India and also being a teacher. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we are doing with our uh, Universal School of Health. We are very happy to begin with our new office. We're gonna have headquarters in the United States very, very soon. Next year, we are gonna be <laughs> fully operational. And we are, we are gonna be located in Clearwater, Florida. Wonderful place. And <clears throat> we are gonna have several courses. We are gonna launch our DHB, our doctorate, uh, doctorate in healthcare business. And we are gonna have some CE courses, continuing education courses, presential and virtual also. And we have something better, also, uh, something great with our Universal School of Health. We're going to help many of our dental and medical entrepreneurs with an innovation center. So you're going to bring your ideas and we are going to help you to make those ideas true. So it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience. And we are very, very happy with this. And this is going to be a wonderful experience for, for doctors from all over the world. And we are going to be very happy to see all of them in our headquarters. So uh, we are going to have some C credits for this course with Dr. Pishwaspadia. And you're gonna find that in the comments part in the Facebook. You can uh, reach for to get your CE credits. Uh, now, on Dr. Bishwas Batia, thank you very much for being with us. We are very happy to have you, and it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you, Dr. Julio. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invite, and uh, special thanks to the Global Summit and uh, Dr. Kyanusha also for inviting me and uh, letting me you know, uh, discuss a topic which is, you know, uh, very, very, uh, people are very apprehensive about uh, this topic. And I must say more than apprehensive, quite doubtful about this topic, okay? Like uh, whether one should go in clinical mm -hmm. practice for it or not, and if gone and if the situation goes out of hand and if the things fail, then, you know, there's a lot of things which can go along with it. So, but I believe that uh, unless and until we keep the basics in mind and uh, we are a little confident Hello? with few cases, then slowly, you know, things are going to fall in place. Yeah, so thanks again, yeah, for uh, letting me speak on the same. So, Dr. Vishwas, you are set in India, uh, near from Delhi, right? And yeah. how do you decide to be a doctor? How do you decide to be a dentist? Uh, yeah, actually, my uh, dad is a surgeon, and uh, he has been practicing since a long, long time. And uh, it just happened uh, once uh, when I was, uh, like, you know, uh, many years ago that I saw a patient visiting his hospital and coming along with his dentures because the patient was not aware that whether it's a dental center or what. And just asking that, you know, please, uh, I, I've come just to get my dentures inserted, okay? And the reason for that was that the patient was having crippled hands and he was not able to insert that denture in the mouth. So it is a very small uh, story which goes along with it. So that day I just felt that, yes, one thing I decided was it gave me a lot of encouragement that, yes, dentistry is something which I should be taking up considering the... Uh, the knowledge which general public was having related to dentists and their oral hygiene. So it was very important to spread that knowledge, especially in a country like India, where uh, extraction is the first thing which used to come to 
uh, to people's mind whenever a pain occurred in a tooth so i thought that it was a very good time to get into it because speaking about it from outside that you know why people are thinking so and getting into the field and then doing something for such people is something which uh, i decided and especially that gave also me an idea that once i am into dentistry i am definitely going to do such things which are going to help especially people like handicapped people people with crippled hands and i am going to prepare certain appliances which are definitely going to help these people then only you know i would feel uh, quite uh, comfortable i would feel that yes my getting into dentistry was a success yeah so that is something which prompted a small story which prompted me to get into it ah wonderful wonderful great and imperial ontology and and surgery how do you start how do you decide after you've been you 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 get your degree how do you decide to this to to get this kind of a specialty in in dentistry yeah actually it started off a couple of years back and uh, see dentistry is something which in today's scenario one uh, cannot uh, be over confident about it because every single case is a new experience a new learning experience and before starting before after finishing my post graduation in prosthodontics still i was quite apprehensive about uh, you know getting into implantology cases but i was very very lucky to uh, get a good uh, bunch of colleagues around me good seniors good juniors also because i feel that learning is not limited to just any uh, one person or so which uh, gave uh, i i would uh, you know first uh, i started assisting few cases and uh, then um, it was a uh, thought that slowly slowly the confidence got built up and i thought that now is the time that i should start with you know small cases and then see how it goes off so uh, it is basically something which you know uh, the confidence which was generated in me with the help of seniors and colleagues and it is always a give and take it's always a process in which you get help in certain cases and you are there to help them in certain cases you are there to help your juniors your students so uh, that always was a good learning experience and with time you know uh, i thought that now is the time that uh, i uh, this, uh, i came across a case around 6 to 7 years back in which you know i got a case with a traumatic central incisor lateral incisor and uh, i was researching i was reading about this technique so i thought that i should be starting this and see how it goes off and i was lucky that it went off pretty well till now yeah okay wonderful wonderful well uh, let's see your topic we are very happy to to have you over here i will let you with all the public from all over the world um uh, please the the audience is all yours thank you very much for being with us thank you sir thank you so much May I know if the slide is visible? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Thank you, Dr. Julio. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome all. Welcome to all the audience uh, across the world, and uh, I welcome you all. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the whole team of uh, Global Summit. Uh, before starting the podinar and i believe it's a wonderful uh, concept of integrating the podcast and the webinars together and uh, it was great to for having them you know choose me to speak on this topic and uh, uh, so before starting i would uh, really want to let you first know certain things about the topic the topic for the today's podinar is partial extraction implantology let's change the rules of the game now before we uh, are uh, wanting to change any rule of a game even if we play, play any uh, damn game with any uh, of our colleague with our child or anything before changing wanting to change change the rules one thing which comes to mind is to get to know the rules first only then it is possible to change the rules so i would first greet you all from uh, my lovely country that is india and uh, i welcome all of you on this uh, wonderful platform
Now, the topic for today is partial extraction implantology that is changing the rules of the game in obviously dental implants. And I am Dr. Professor Vishwas Bhatia from India. Now, as a clinician, first we need to know that what are the game challenges which we face in day-to-day -day practice. Now, the first challenge which I'm going to share with you all is something which many of us, including me also, uh, many of us miss, and that is the patient's psychology. Now, patient psychology is something, as they say, in a complete denture. They say once you give a complete denture, it seems as if you are, in a way, you are married to that person because that person won't leave you all your life with certain issues here or there, which is a part and parcel of that kind of treatment. But what do you mean by patient psychology? Patient psychology means when a person is what I believe, when a person comes to you, he is going to come with an expectation that out of 10, I'm going to get you know, a treatment whose prognosis is going to be approximately nine or so. And that is the basis on which the patient is going to rate a clinician. But I, as a clinician, what I try to do in the first appointment or the second appointment, especially in cases like dentures or any other treatment, I first try to make the patient aware of his or her clinical scenario. I would like to tell the patient the difference between an ideal clinical scenario and the clinical scenario which is there in the particular patient's mouth. And, uh, so that is something which the patient needs to know. Once the patient gets to know the knowledge of that, there is when the patient would start having lesser expectation Maybe out of 10, the patient will now have an expectation of six, that my treatment outcome is going to be six out of 10. So let it be the same and let your work speak for itself. And once after that, once you give a good treatment to the patient, that, that is when the patient is going to get back to a nine or a rating of 10. And that is a boon for you. So this is what I always believe that in the beginning, always be frank with the patient and try to change the patient's psychology. Tell, try to tell the patient because see, a patient doesn't bother whether the, uh, he's wanting a implant with the help of immediate implantology, with the help of partial extraction implantology, with the help of uh, delayed implant protocol. No, he has just come with a complaint of replacing the missing tooth. So we need to understand that first. Second, bone loss. If bone loss is there, the patient needs to be told about it and the patient needs to be aware at the beginning itself and what are the pros and cons of replacing or adding on the bone okay or using treatment options which are going to prevent bone loss so those things need to be clearly explained to the patients secondly aesthetics aesthetics is what the patient has come for and that is a great challenge now i would say there are many many treatments which are going all over the world uh, grafting procedures, n number of procedures to get the lost tooth structure back. But the main reason for taking up this topic today is that why do we need to get the lost tooth structure back when in first place we can try our best to preserve what natural tooth structure is already there. If we can preserve the natural tooth structure which is already there, then there is this the aesthetic part would never ever remain a challenge for any dentist. Next, the position. Position is very, very important. If we are getting hold of such a technique in which there is a natural position which is already available and a natural guide, not a guided surgery, but a natural guide which is already available for us to place the implant, I think that is the best part. And then comes the angulation. Angulation Definitely related to position. Sometimes the position might be absolutely correct, but the angulation might not be correct. So if we get hold of, or we get a knowledge about uh, such type of a technique, which is going to help us in uh, combining all these factors and uh, that a certain technique, which helps us in lessening our challenges and letting us concentrate more on our work, I think that is the best part of our treatment planning. So my friends, let's begin with the game. 
no partial extraction implantology now let's begin with a fact first now dental implants are a remarkable technology but in future we are we will likely to see them become even more impressive as additional technologies will be utilized and increase in uh, and increase the speed accuracy and longevity of the procedure now as compared to conventional implantology definitely we need to add on certain technologies add on certain innovations so that we can give better better treatment options to the patient and something which is you know going to be beneficial for the patient now there's always a difference between perception and reality let me give an example this is something which we all wish for especially in a case of implantology we would always want a patient with beautiful papilla beautiful keratinization of the mucosa beautiful bone level so that that would help us in achieving an aesthetic outcome a beautiful emergence profile so but unfortunately this is not always the case sometimes what the situation which we get is remarkably different from what we are expecting so sometimes we might get situations like this also in which there is a huge defect buccally and now we have procedures definitely to uh, try to get it back to normal but we know the expertise and other scenarios which need to be taken into place before we go for such procedures and sometimes we might come across situations like this also so there are many many scenarios in which sometimes the patient you might give good options to the patients and the patient might not at all want to go for processes like beautiful removal partial processes or a fixed partial uh, denture or so because conservation is something which all patients are nowadays aware and definitely ethically if we have another treatment option then why not go for it if it is indicated so there is always a difference between perception and what in real it is now dimensional changes Uh, dimensional changes always occur after tooth extraction now it's a landmark article in journal of clinical periodontology which was an experimental study in dogs which concluded that the resorption of the buccal or the lingual walls of the extraction site occurred in overlapping phases during phase 1 the bundle bone was resorbed and replaced by woven bone since the crest of the bundle uh, buccal bone wall was comprised solely of bundle this modeling resulted in substantial vertical reduction of the buccal crest now why i am sharing these facts with you is that we any new technique which we uh, want to plan there has to be good evidence behind it evidence based dentistry is something which needs to be followed if i am uh, if i am uh, incorporating certain technique in the practice i should be knowing the literature behind it the studies behind it and why only then it should prompt me to take up a technique i would never ever do a technique just because some of the colleagues or some of the uh, uh seniors or junior uh, uh juniors are trying it okay because trial is something different from actually doing it now coming on to certain uh, systemic review now a systemic review of post extraction alveolar hard and soft tissue dimensional changes was published in clinical of oral implants research in 2012 and the search included many articles and there were 20 studies which uh, met the inclusion criteria and what it concluded was that horizontal bone loss of approximately 29 to 63% and a vertical bone loss of 11 to 22% that is a major percentage of bone loss occurred after 6 months of extraction also ridge alterations post extraction in aesthetic zone with a uh, cbct study it it uh, concluded that there was a, a correlation identified that a facial bone wall thickness of less than 1 mm is a critical factor associated with the extent of bone resorption means 1 mm is something which is such a critical factor that would prompt us to decide whether we should be going for an extraction procedure or not so the question arises why partial extraction implantology is needed in the first place when we have so many conventional procedures conventional immediate implant procedures then why the need for partial extraction implantology 
as you can see certain scenarios when uh, the sometimes patients come to us with a gray tinge on the surface of the mucosa aesthetics is something which is of major concern sometimes the patient presents with findings like this also okay especially in thin gingival biotype cases sometimes the patients come with situations like this in which a dentist has given a a process is over an implant just for the heck of giving it or just because the patient needs a tooth the tooth needs modifications for being placed on such type of placement so such a placement is something which is not at all tolerated and this is what the patient eventually gets okay so though there are procedures to cover up this thing but we need to now understand if we understand the biomechanics the forces which are occurring on the incisal aspect of this processes we can imagine how much cantilever is going on along the long axis of the implant so these are the things which definitely need to be avoided sometimes the prosthesis over the uh, uh, the implant is over contoured okay and time when there is a bulk of over contour over over the processes we would see that there is an apical movement of the gingival margin so the facial contour should always be flatter than the contralateral natural tooth especially in such cases so that we can avoid as much apical displacement of the soft tissue as possible so these are all the scenarios which one needs to play with if proper positioning and proper direction of the implant is not followed sometimes placements are in such a way that there are so parallelly placed now you can imagine the scenario which i was talking about you can just imagine if the forces are are acting along the long axis of the tooth how much cantilever is going to be uh, cantilever force is going to be there on the implant so the determinants of success are vertical bone height in the interproximal sides and the horizontal thickness and the vertical height of the buccal bone in the edentulous side mark my words buccal bone is the key here which we need to catch so this is something which we long for this is something which we practice dentistry for that a prosthesis should be such that no one would be able to make out which tooth has been treated or which is the tooth which is being treated and and prosthesis has been placed over it there should be no soft tissue or hard tissue demarcation between the tooth supported uh, natural crown uh, between the natural uh, tooth and the crown placed over an implant now there are any number of procedures which are being followed since years in which implants are being placed grafts are being used uh, augmentation procedures and covering the jumping distance and all those things which we also definitely follow but if there is a technique in which we can avoid ourselves from such cumbersome procedures in which we are going to get to know the outcome not immediately but after few months and that too we are not going to be we are not sure about the kind of outcome which are, which we are going to get i'm talking especially in cases of uh, soft tissue uh, rehabilitations so in that case if we get a technique in which we can avoid such scenarios i think it would be the best so sometimes what happens is we as clinicians we as such i also have a team which work together and we have different opinions on a single particular patient and we give the patient options that okay i'm going to plan a i have a plan b i have a plan c if plan a into go, goes out of order i'm going to go with plan b then i'm going to go with plan c but and we feel that the patient is because any patient every single patient is a valuable patient so it would represent a picture like this but unfortunately what the patient is thinking is something else over indulgence of treatment options over uh, you know uh, giving the patient different different options and confusing the patient is something which would be the worst possible scenario so our treatments should be simple should be productive and we should have a good fair idea about the prognosis prognosis before we start the treatment and what is the basic key before starting the treatment that is proper diagnosis 
even in partial extraction in plantology, many, many failures. Even I have certain failures in my practice. Many, many failures are only, only because though the percentage of failures is less, the more and more you practice this technique, the more and more you get the outcomes, you get confidence regarding this technique, but you would feel that the, the when from the starting point, the diagnosis is wrong of choosing the case for partial extraction implantology, there is where the problem lies. So success is there always in front of us. There is something which we feel what is missing, which is, the, which is not letting us cover the distance between us and success. But what we always forget is that something is always in our hand and that is innovating, doing new things in a different manner. Doing new things in a different, different manner, or I would rather say doing the same things which all are doing, but in a different manner with keeping the basics in mind. So what are we missing? Challenges are not going to stop anytime, but what we need to become is a little smart dentist in which we are going to explain the patient the challenge, we are going to explain the pros, and most importantly, explain the patient the cons of the treatment also. Do prepare the patient for such kind of cases, and if the patient try to get that, uh, try to uh, encourage the patient and give that confidence to the patient that what I'm going to do is definitely going to help you out. And the best part about this technique is that anytime you feel that there are certain things during the surgical procedure which have gone wrong, there is always, always a plan B in action. The surgery is always going to get completed, so there is no scenario in which you would feel that partial extraction implantology procedure was a failure at the time of implant placement. Even if there are certain things which have not fallen in place during the surgical aspect, you always have a plan B in action. So great things always happen when you get out of your comfort zone. So one has to just keep trying, okay? So root membrane implantology, partial extraction implantology, socket shield implantology. All the techniques, different, different names from different, different wonderful researchers and all having certain small, small differences in their, uh, in their uh, the reasons. They have a certain uh, difference in the, uh, if I'll give you an example. Now, root membrane. The researchers always uh, believe in the fact that it is the root which is attached to the periodontal membrane and the periodontal membrane is the one which is supplying, uh, you know, uh, the bundle bone. So they have given the name root membrane from there, from this is the scenario from which this name has arised. Socket shield. The researchers have emphasized on the fact that it is a shield which is protecting the buckle, the bundle bone, the uh, bone present buccally to collapse. So this is the part of the tooth which is left in the socket is a shield which is allowing the which is preventing the collapse of the buccal bone. So here is the word which is uh, from the here is the scenario from which this word socket shield has arised that is preventing the collapse of the socket. And partial extraction implantology, as obviously, because we are not extracting the teeth fully and we are placing the implant along with a part of the tooth there is the, that is the reason why the partial extraction implantology term has come up. Now, what is the hypothesis? What is the base on which the partial extraction implantology is being practiced? The basic hypothesis is that the loss of the periodontium, that is the tooth, periodontal ligament, dental papilla, the subcrestal fibers, the lamina dura, it affects the remaining gingival aesthetics, including the aesthetics around the dental implant means once the periodontium is lost, okay, there are certain things which get affected, as can, you can see in the uh, picture, especially the bundle bone. Bundle bone, as I mentioned before, is the key, which is the nutrition house, which once it gets affected, it is definitely going to lead to the collapse of the buccal bone. Now, our teeth and dental implants the same. The bundle bone and the family of fibers, that is the different types of fibers, the dentino-gingival, the dentoperiosteal, all fibers that create the architecture of the dental papilla, they all belong to the tooth. This needs to be always kept in mind. Now, 
there are scenarios in which we take we extract the teeth out we replace it with bone but many a times because of the normal physiologic process what we get is the defects after few months now dimensional loss following tooth extraction of the teeth is independent of whether a flap is raised an implant is placed or a bone graft is placed at the time of extraction so ontogenically the buccal plate and more specifically the bundle bone belongs to the tooth and removal of the tooth will automatically lead result in lead to loss of the bundle bone and surface modeling of the cortical plate to a certain extent so what is the bottom line the bottom line is periodontium is already there what we all need as clinicians is just respect it okay now so the rules are changing okay we see people with different kinds of shoes today we see people with different doing uh, uh, different uh, cheating in games you know definitely in a positive manner okay i'm talking about small children but what are they trying to do they are trying to find out a new scenario a new opportunity not for themselves but for the future generation also so that you know we can try out things which is because unless and until we feel that okay if people are trying why should we be we should uh, why should we do the same let enough research happen happen around it and then uh, then uh, go for such treatments but i believe the opposite now changing the rules of the game means like in socket shield what we are basically doing is that we are basically leaving a part of the tooth structure buccally okay and then placing the implant palatal to the part of the tooth structure which is left so as you can see in the picture here if i tell you the scenario 360 degree scenario around the implant we are going to have bone more than 180 degrees encircling the implant that is on the mesial side on the distal side of the implant and palatally and we are going to have a sliver of tooth a thin shield or a thin section of the tooth left just buckly to it so how it is going to help us is that because we have left a part of the tooth structure buckly to the implant so the periodontal ligament is intact the nourishment of that region is as apt as before and that is one thing which is going to help the collapse of this bone buccally and this is greatly going to help us in preserving the natural architecture i'm going to explain how so different scenarios when we need we are using such techniques to uh, preserve a Uh, the level of the bone in which a pontic needs to be placed from there the term comes as the pontic shield root submergence a technique which is used since long leaving a part of the root to preserve the bone levels or the proximal shield especially used in cases in which we need good intact interdental papilla in that case we leave a part of the tooth structure on the mesial side on the distal side and section from uh, labial to palatal now root submergence technique if we, i go on to the evidence behind it a landmark article by dr morris salama in 2007 suggested a strategy to improve to provide a more predictable protocol for aesthetic implant treatment for multiple tooth defects using root submergence technique and what was concluded is that that implants will never surpass the natural tooth's ability to preserve the surrounding bone and soft tissues and retention of natural tooth root allows for maximum preservation of surrounding alveolar bone and along with that the most important soft tissues so the socket shield technique the proof of principle report by dr Hasler and his co-associates. It was first published in 2010 in Journal of Clinical Periodontology. It described a technique of leaving a sliver of tooth root attached to the buccal aspect to preserve the periodontal ligament vasculature to the bundle bone and prevent its collapse. Now it is a PDN-mediated implant placement. So this concept relies on preservation of remaining root. Once the remaining root is preserved, you preserve the periodontal ligament. once you preserve the periodontal ligament and its fibers you preserve the buccal bone 
buccal bone automatically is going to preserve the buccal tissue and the surrounding soft tissue aesthetics. How? First, tooth loss leads to loss of periodontal ligament and vascular vessels associated. Now, these vessels help to nourish the buccal bone plate, especially the thin buccal bone. This loss triggers bone resorption, mainly four to six months post extraction. And this loss of buccal bone plate leads to contraction of the overlying soft tissues, which definitely is going to be very, very unesthetic. Now, the list is long. Now here, what, are, what is the list? Uh, what is the list which we are talking about? List is regarding the different types of treatment procedures which are being followed. Guided bone regeneration, membrane and membrane augmentation procedures with grafting procedures, gingival grafts. Now these techniques may limit or mask the unpleasant effects of bone resorption of the buccal bone plate. But we all need to be frank about it, but none can completely eliminate the problem linked to and caused by extraction of the tooth. Here, my friends, I want to tell you that I have full respect for all these techniques. We also have been practicing in our uh, practices these techniques since long. But what I believe is that there cannot be comparison between a natural apparatus aesthetically and an apparatus which is being built or rehabilitated with these procedures. Definitely, we can always go close to natural, but definitely there is a reason why the natural apparatus is called as the God's gift. So let's accept this fact. Now, there are certain, now the socket shield technique, first histological, clinical and volumetric observation after separation of buccal tooth segment, a pilot study, which said that intentional Retention of buccal root fragment prevents osteoclastic remodeling and consequent resorption of the buccal plate. Now, a common pattern seen in these studies is the formation of new cementum. Okay, now uh, that is inner to the internal dentinal surfaces of the retained fragment. Now, that is between the implant and the inner segment of the root which was left. It was seen that new cementum was formed. Okay. Now, a step-by-step -step description of the PDL-mediated risk preservation of immediate implant rehabilitation in aesthetic region by Mitsias and the associates. They reported a follow-up of three years, which revealed that the tissue stability was remarkable. The gingival zenith was comparable to natural remaining uh, the, to the neighboring natural tooth and papilla, completely filled with the completely filled the interdental embrasure. Radiographically, most importantly, the root fragment remained clearly visible in contact with the implant and proximal bone levels are stable because this was, these were the levels which were responsible for the lovely interdental papillas. And no abnormal reaction at the bone implant interface was noted. Once I start showing up certain cases, you would be able to more visualize these facts. Now, these are the certain things which have been uh, publicized till now and uh, people have been researching till date also. Now, coming on to certain cases. Now, this is the case of 22-year-old male patient who had the chief concern of fractured teeth in the maxillary anterior region following trauma two months back. Now, there was nothing significant in the history and the, uh, the findings which were taken prior to uh, planning the treatment. General examination, everything was normal extra examination there are certain scenarios which we do before taking up the cases that is extra symmetry the interpapillary lines the mid facial lines the facial symmetry all was absolutely normal now the interoral examination revealed a traumatic central incisor that is 2 1 and lateral incisor that is 1 2 and the right and the left profile pics can be seen and the occlusal view showed that there was fracture of the segment. So what prompted me to think of practicing or to try partial extraction in such a case was that there was the keratinization was proper, there was no labial defect, there was no fracture of the labial fragment. So that is one thing which prompted me because he was a young patient, so I did not 
feel it was right to extract it completely. And the reason why I planned for uh, partial extraction in such a case was after looking at the CBCT, which I'm going to explain later. So the gingiva, the color, contour, consistency, the surface texture was absolutely normal. There was definitely localized periodontitis in certain areas as can be seen. Localized gingivitis in relation to 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. Now the biotype was thin. The gingival zenith can be seen. There was slight discrimination between the adjacent teeth. We could note that the, the patient had a gummy smile. What was positive for us was the interpupillary line was parallel to the occlusal plane. The buccal corridor deficiency was there and filling up of buccal corridors was needed, which had to be done in the final phase. Now investigations, CBC, bleeding, clotting time, the regular investigations before the surgeries were performed. The CBCT revealed something very, very important. Now, analysis of the cross-section revealed a very thin buccal plate with a width ranging from 0.2 to 0.7 mm. Now, you can see in this situation, if we would have planned to extract the teeth, either we would have to go for uh, bone grafts, we would have to replace the lost tooth because there was no uh, scenario in which the labial bone would not be fractured in such a case because there was hardly any labial bone. So it was planned to place an implant by leaving a part of the labial bone because the, we could see, uh, sorry, place an implant by leaving a part of the labial root portion. Surgical site was prepared, the administration of local anesthesia and preoperative rinsing with 0.12 chlorhexidine. Fractured portion of the involved tooth removed with extraction forcep. I'm going to show each and every step in detail and care should be always taken during reduction of the buccal aspect of the root. Because it is very important that it remains 0.5 to 1 mm supracrestally so that we do not lose the supracrestal fibers in that region because that is going to affect our labial aesthetics. A long shank burr was taken, sectioning of the tooth. Here it is very important that two indentations should be made parallel to the long axis of the root. Now, here when we are taking the burr, along the long axis. It is very important that what I always follow is that I take, I come at a three o'clock position to the patient and I try to use the adjacent teeth as a guide, okay? And I try to take the long axis absolutely parallel to the long axis of the adjacent teeth because once the crown portion has been removed, it is sometimes difficult to visualize the long axis of the root present. So always when in the CBCT, one can take an analysis that there is not much difference in the, in the axial position of the, of the, in the sagittal plane. There is, we can see, analyze on the CBCT that there is not much discrepancy between two adjacent teeth. So one can always use the adjacent teeth as a guide to take the long shank burr into the, uh, into the canal so that it is always a clear cut which is being made on the mesial and the distal aspects. So after the indentations are made, we need to be sure that the section has been proper. Now here, one needs to be very careful that after you reach the apical portion, always and always take a radiographic uh, analysis, always take an IOPA and see whether the apical portion has been, has been removed or not. Why? Because sometimes what happens is when a, a tactile sensation is something which helps a lot in such case, when we are, uh, we are uh, cutting on the mesial and the distal side of the root, we can see, we can, we can judge that, yes, we have cut it and we have reached the root portion. But uh, immediately after that, if we try with a periotome, we try to remove the palatal portion, what would happen is if the sectioning is not proper, we might also dislodge the buccal fragment also from its place. And if the buccal fragment is dislodged, we can understand that the periodontal fibers have already been torn. And once the buccal and the, once the periodontal fibers are torn, then our purpose is defeated. So we need to be very careful that once we are taking the long shank burr, apically, we need to cut the 
through and through the apical segment also. Now, the root can come either in segments or as a single part. That's not an issue at all. The buccal portion is left. Now what is done is sequential thinning. Sequential thinning is very, very important of the buccal fragment once the palatal portion is out. We can also use instruments to guide the, uh, the trimming of the buccal fragment. Means we need to take the gingival margin little away so that we do not damage it and so that our, our soft tissue aesthetics is not affected. And here what we are doing is we are trying to take the buccal fragment little apical so that we are just 0.5 to 1 mm above the uh, crestal bone. And we also need to thin it approximately 1 millimeters. Now, a question might arise, why, what is the need for thinning? We need to thin it so that we do not give a lot of cantilever into the processes because and we remove the internal internal dentinal surfaces of any bacteria and we also thin it so that whenever we need to give a processes if we place an implant and it is a thick buccal portion which is left so the processes is going to be a kind the it could be a slight cantilever in the processes because of aesthetics we would be wanting a good emergence profile and we would not be able to give that if there is a thick buccal portion left so we need to thin it properly and that needs to be done very, very slowly because we do not need to dislodge it. And how we need to do that, I'm going to explain. Once the thinning is done, the sequential drilling as per the regular drilling protocol is done. Then here we place the 3.75 by 11.5 millimeter implant and the implant size foot would allow for retention of the root section. Here we can see the, the implant placed palatal to the root segment. After the abutment is placed, a screw retained provisional restoration is fabricated. The IOPA would show us the tooth along with the shield around it. These are the IOPAs of the central and the lateral incisors. So this is the pre-operative photograph. And this was the post-operative which we could achieve. So we can see that the keratinization, the gingival contours and, um, and uh, the aesthetics are quite close to the normal, which we would not be able, which would be, which we would not have been able to achieve. Definitely certain aesthetic procedures can more be done, but the patient was as such happy with the aesthetic outcome. I did not want any further uh, uh, treatments because uh, uh, such treatment is a is I I would uh, like to make a note of this that it is psychologically very beneficial. Though we are leaving just point uh, one millimeter, 0.75 to one millimeter of tooth structure in thickness, but it is a psychological advantage which we have over the patient that my complete tooth is not removed. I have a part of my tooth structure left. Though we as clinicians knows that that is know that it is negligible. So this was the pre-operative uh, photograph. All the consents from the patient was taken regarding his photograph on this kind of platform. And those was readily given to the patient because he definitely wanted to show off his new smile. And uh, definitely he had a good gummy smile, which he was very comfortable and did not want to get any changes in the same. So we could see the markedly difference in the uh, profile and the aesthetics of the patient. Now, this was the follow-up after close to six years and four months. We can see the profile on the left side, right side, and the front. And touch wood, the things were going absolutely fine. <clears throat> now, these pictures I'm sharing just to show that once we removed after so many years when we removed the processes, definitely he required some cleanings and everything. And uh, we, were, we were regularly uh, taking out his processes and maintaining his hygiene beneath the processes and around. And he was a regular patient with the, he was a patient regular with follow-ups, which is very, very important in any treatment. You, you can see that the, the interdental papillae, which were absolutely in place, no collapse, nothing, Soft tissue, heart tissue positioning were fine according to the patient's scenario and we were quite happy regarding it. 
coming on to another case which was a case of uh, canine in which a patient reported with a previously treated uh, tooth with a crown over it and a dislodged crown along with a part of the tooth structure and we could see that in such a case first we need to imagine that whether we would be because see there is a there needs to be a reason of plan of planning there is needs to be a reason why you need to plan a partial extraction uh, therapy in such cases we could see the labial half the palatal half and this is the imaginary line which we would want for sectioning and we would want to see whether this is would be an ideal case in which we would be able to preserve the natural aesthetics now i would believe it's with with certain cases i believe that this is a technique if you have the expertise and you uh, train yourself i would again say that it needs every case is a learning case and you would see problems associated with associated with each and every case i also do not have 100% success rate in all my cases but a 70 to 80% success rate is a good enough case and also the cases in which you feel that there are scenarios in which when you are trying to remove the uh, you are trying to thin off the buccal buccal uh, uh, sliver of tooth and it gets dislodged you always have a plan b in action to use the conventional methods and place the implants so once the sectioning was done here we could see the palatal half or the palatal proportion of the root in one piece we could take it out next is evaluating the palatal section this is something which is very very important my friends mark my word this is a technique in which you need to give good amount of time and patience patience is the key here you need to once the palatal portion is out with success i feel 50 to 60% of the work is done because this is the key taking the palatal portion out without disturbing the labial portion or the buccal portion once this is out most important is evaluating what we need to evaluate let us see evaluating the labial root section first thing we need to evaluate whether there is any movement in the labial section or not then we need to evaluate it apically apico coronally we need to evaluate it mesodistally we also need to evaluate it labio palatally apart from that when i talk about this we need to evaluate whether we have gone till the apical portion or not because this is a very very important step we need to evaluate whether circumferentially half of the root is out or not that is also very very important because we need more than 180 degrees encirclement encirclement of an implant around of an implant with bone which is going to help us in osseo integration more than 180 degrees so that even if there is no osseo integration between the shield and the implant still we have good amount of osseo integration which is going to give us a very very good prognosis but as we progress through this webinar i'm going to show you certain scenarios in which you would be surprised that some studies have even shown an osseo integration or bone around the implant that is very very close to even 360 degrees now here when we evaluated the, in the next step the, the shield is ready to undergo thinning and shaping thinning of the shield and shaping done once the thinning is done it is always and always important to measure the width of the shield as i already mentioned to avoid any cantilevers to have good aesthetics and it is also important to take the level of the uh, shield just 0.5 to 1 mm suprachoral once things are determined all the things are in place sequential drilling is done following the regular protocols then the implant placement is done now there are certain tips i have tried to incorporate certain sketches which i made myself to uh, help you better understand certain things which we need to follow in such cases i hope that would be helpful which i am going to share in the later slides so here we can see the natural apparatus buckley the shield the implant placed uh, the implant placed 
and eventually the process is fabricated and the process is inserted in the patient's mouth. Here is the photograph of the process is inserted in relation to the canine and we can appreciate the labial soft tissue and the heart tissue contour. This is the IUP of the implant placed after the fabrication of processes. Then coming on to the next case, which is a case of a lateral incisor. Again, the same protocols form uh, protocols followed. Here we had uh, two teeth which had to be uh, rehabilitated, the lateral incisor and along with that, the second premolar. So the above picks are a sequential uh, uh, stepwise picks of the lateral incisors and below you can see the sequential stepwise picks of the second premolar. Evaluation of the apical portion. Now it is very, very important that the one important protocol of taking the implant three to four millimeter apical to the apical portion of the root. That needs to be followed in this scenario also. So it is very important that the judgment of the distance need to be apt. And that means once we are sec sectioning the root, we should not uh, stop. The drilling needs to go two to three millimeters beyond that uh, section for primary stability. Now here, as I've shown, shown both the scenarios in the second premolar, we were um, uh, able to take out the palatal portion and the lateral uh, incisor, we, would, we were able to take out it in pieces. Now, the sectioning also can be done in two scenarios. Either we can section through a long shank burr by placing mesial and distal movement, by doing the mesial and distal movement, or we can also do another method, which I'm going to explain through sketches. Now, once the thinning of the shield is done, the implant is placed, and here we can see the implant placed in both the sides. This was the IOP after placement of the implant, and then the soft tissue after a week to 10 days time. We can see the labial aesthetics maintained. Another case of central incisor. Here these, was, these, these were among the very, very few uh, first cases in which the patient did not want extra complete extraction of the teeth, but wanted a scenario in which the part of the tooth must be there or the tooth must be there. So we, after an informed consent, the implant was placed along with the socket shield or the root membrane technique in the central incisor region. Another case in which a central incisor was rehabilitated using these, these were the initial cases which helped us in, you know, uh, seeing how it goes off and touch with the patients are still uh, continuing with the processes and the bone levels are still stable. Now, are there any long-term studies that to in humans means you would see in on the web a lot of literature, a lot of uh, uh, you know literature reviews, a lot of scenarios in which you know histological studies also. But before 2017, maximum or most of the histological studies were there on animals, not on humans, because I hope everybody can understand. In such scenarios, it is very difficult to get the human specimens and see how the procedure has gone off. Uh, but in 2017, we realized that human histology can never lie. And this study gave us, gave us me and more clinicians like us, uh, more confidence in practicing and in, in planning cases for such type of techniques, because it was seen that there was bone which was there formed between the implant and the shield. So till now, what I have been talking about, the encirclement more than 180 degrees around the implant, it was a surprise in this histological study. The study revealed that there was trabecular mature bone at the interfa interface of the implant. The bone was present between the implant and the root, okay? The root membrane, the root is the part of the so structure labelly which was left and the root membrane and the buccal bone plate appeared intact without any signs of absorption uh, resorption secondly it also showed that there was compact bone in the medial thirds and the apical portion of the implant and there was no gaps between uh, present in the interface 
along with that it was really surprising to see that there was even in the apical part it was observed that there was cementum which had migrated as can be seen in the picture from the residual root to the implant surface and in the coronal portion between the root and the implant there was connective tissue but without any in inflammatory infiltrate so this was a lovely study which was published by dr mitsias and his associates in the research article in 2017 in journal biomed research international the root membrane technique human histological evidence after 5 years of function i believe this is the first histological human study which was published and it was very great to meet this dynamic personality who had worked uh, worked so hard and is still in the process of researching and working uh, advancements in this technique so thanks uh, dr mitsias for such a lovely research now what to do if there is mobility of the buccal fragment before implant placement means if there is certain mobility what can we do simply abort and change to plan b it's simple go for complete extraction followed by immediate implant and if the implant fails to osseo integrate but the socket shield is stable immobile and free of infection then what to do here the implant can be removed and the defect can be closed and left to heal reevaluate after few months and then attempt an implant placement again now what are the advantages everything comes with advantages and certain limitations also now advantages are definitely it protects the integrity of the buccal bone the technique acts as a guidance for implant placement in optimal position so that we avoid such scenarios which i had shown before then it is cost effective then the interdental papilla cost effective means you are saving a lot on the grafts and all those things secondly interdental papilla can be preserved by interdental socket shield limitations technique sensitivity it it uh, uh, you know requires highly trained operators operators patience to avoid mobility of the shield these are the limitations you need to be patient in this technique then risk of displacement of the root fragment long term behavior of buccal shield hasn't been completely clarified till now and the periodontal membrane may be formed around the implant when the implant root interface has a loose structure and a larger gap is left means now as uh, dr mitsia stated in his uh, in his article like he stated that are there any scenarios like whether the space between the implant and the shield should it be left as it is should be now dr mitsia and his associate recommend that the space should be left as it is okay because there is going to be uh, osseo uh, blastic activity in that space because of the blood clot which is present already and the space is going to get filled some researchers recommend even filling up uh, the space between the shield and the implant with the graft material so there are the different scenarios but ultimately the histological analysis after 5 years has shown that there is good amount of bone between the shield and the implant also there has been study uh by dr husler and his associates also in 2018 i believe which was again a histological analysis uh in which a patient reported and a fragment uh, of the tooth was histologically uh histological evidence was taken and it was in the study it was revealed that there was good amount of bone Bit between compact bone between the implant and the shield. Now, in just I just wanted to bring in because this is a totally different topic whether socket shield can be done in a digital way or not. This is something which can be taken up in a separately different uh, webinar or a webinar. But I have added just two slides to show you that yes, implant planning is also done for socket shield in which the Uh, the analysis is done the labial buccal palatal bone levels are are evaluated and the virtual placements are being done and such cases are also now being done which is helping a lot definitely the shield needs to be first taken out and then the guide placed now 
some clinical observations and tips before I conclude this session. Let us go to first scenario. Here, as you can see in the di diagrammatic sketch or in the uh, representation here, now once a visualization of the sectioning of the root is done, that is the labial root, labial section and the root palatal section, it is very important to take the adjacent teeth as a guide, which many, many people miss, okay? With due respect to all who are practicing such type of technique. Now, why it is important is, as I mentioned, because in the first step itself, because sometimes what happens is, if we plan that we are not going to uh, remove the, the crown portion and we are going to directly go to uh, use a long shank and enter, that is a big, big no, because you need to go till the apical portion and we need to remove uh, the crown aspect and then we need to enter. It is very important that while imagining where to section, section it by using the adjacent teeth as a guide. Secondly, always keep your finger on the labial aspect of the soft tissue so that you can always feel a tactile sensation once your drill is going close to the apical portion. Thirdly, it is very, very important. Now, there are two ways in which we can take the palatal shield out. One is by using a long shank, which has been uh, advised by uh, the researchers too, that either take the long shank and make a demarcation on the mesial side and on the distal side. And once the cut is appropriate, try to gently take the palatal portion out. Secondly, we can also use the implantology, uh, the, uh, the implantology, the birds we can use and section the, we can grind the root portion out. But I personally feel that is a more traumatic experience rather than taking the root portion out after sectioning just with a long, shank burr. That is the reason why in my whole presentation, I have not mentioned that technique. Secondly, the direction of the burr. The direction of the burr, as can be seen in the picture, always needs to be mesial, distal, mesial, distal. Now here, when I'm taking my burr on the mesial and the distal direction, I'm also, I'm also keeping in mind that my the bodily pressure of my burr should be on the palatal aspect of the root, not on the buccal aspect. Because here is the point in which, because once a sectioning is done, okay, once a sectioning is done and then the root fragment palatally is taken out, okay, it is very, very technique sensitive. So here the tip what I want to give is that we know that we need to do thinning of the buccal portion. Now, when we need to do thinning of the buccal or the labial aspect of the root, I would advise once the burr has reached the apical portion, first do the thinning of the buccal sliver of root which is left. And then along with that, do the mesial and the distal sectioning. Because what happens is once the mesial and distal sectioning is done, and then we then we plan to take the palatal root out. And I'm just telling, trying to tell these things based on the, my clinical experience. And then we try to take the palatal root out. What sometimes happens is after the sectioning is done, then we have two slits. Slits means there are empty space. And now the buccal aspect can rotate along with our burr, the long shank burr and enter that space and get dislodged from its original place, leading to tearing off of the PDL ligament and hence leading to abortion of our procedure. So I personally, once I take the long shank burr into the canal, I first try to thin out the labial section. Along with that, I do the mesial and the distal sectioning so that once my, uh, uh, my labial uh, part is thinned out, then still it doesn't have anywhere to move. It doesn't have any rotational force, which is going to let it get any space. But if I make my sections prior, my mesial and distal sections, then the labial sliver of tooth will get space to move or rotate inside the socket. So this is a very, very thing, important thing, which 
can be very very helpful third scenario now if a drill is being used uh, for uh, for uh, grinding the palatal portion out it is very very important that the either drill used to remove the palatal portion of the root out or the drill being used as a regular protocol before placement of the implant it is very important that there should be bodily pressure of on the drill on the palatal portion because if it, that is not done there are very much chances that the labial sliver of tooth might this get dislodged from its place why because we use the drill only after sectioning on the mesial and the distal side and then the labial uh, sliver of tooth gets space to enter those areas and get dislodged so it is very important here there should be always bodily pressure on the palatal side as i marked there on the sketch so it is very important that always prefer thinning of the shield before sectioning this is my personal uh, advice or personal experience it depends definitely from clinician to clinician and what i feel is that if we section uh, if we section the root fragment okay after thinning the shield it is always helpful so many many questions many many questions come to mind whether the technique should be done whether the uh, you know it is going to be a success but i always believe that we cannot long for success unless and until we try something failures are a part of anything which we do in life but unless and until we try something new that to not only on the uh, that to not uh, just a flu but with keeping evidence in mind and keeping the basics in mind it is always going to be helpful to conclude i would like to say that it seems to be an exciting technique for preserving the integrity of buccal bone in immediate implant patients and every technique comes with a learning curve and set of potential complications so my advice would be just keep trying because the fact is that one who has no bone has ample money one who has ample money uh, and one who has ample bone has no money so just keep innovating keep doing the same things in different manner as the saying goes behind every successful man there is a woman similarly behind every successful woman is also a man so just keep trying thanks for your time for your reference there are certain books of mine as authors some books on uh, mcqs for the upcoming students some books on implant supported overdentures some chapters on facial for forensic reconstruction in textbook of forensic odontology which is quite a popular book in india some recognitions some awards to my credit these all just give us some motivations to do better and better some things because i have the thought process of doing something new uh, something my aim of doing dentistry is not just to treat patients but but to find some new methods some new techniques that is going to help not only normal individuals but to specially abled people also that is the reason why in the list you may see some awards on innovations some awards on uh, different types of uh, rehab uh, appliances uh, in which the patient can use certain things with the help of intraoral uh, musculatures patient can do their day to day activities without hands and which is greatly going to help them in uh, having a good livelihood for themselves so that is my aim of taking up dentistry i hope uh, dr julian got the answer which he asked in the beginning of the session what was the reason for taking up dentistry and uh, so small takeaways evidence based is the key trying new things is important but always keep the basics in mind thanks for being a lovely audience namaste from india god bless you all these are my details i'm uh, obliged to the global summit
to Dr. Julio and all you wonderful audiences to giving for giving your time to me. And these are my details. Any queries, anything, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Vishwas. It was very, very nice presentation. I really love it. Uh, as you said, we always have to improve our world and, and improve our work. And the idea of these new techniques and these kind of techniques in every, uh, every periodontal and surgery um, um, practices, it's very, very important. We always have to have something to reach when you have the case. So as more techniques that you work with, it's the better for your patients. Thank you very much. We love your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the invite. Thanks to the whole team, I would say. Yeah. And doctors, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, don't forget to do your nominations for the hundred uh, the top hundred doctors, we are uh, we have the nominations open still open, and if you have someone who you would like to be part of this, please nominate them in each of the uh, uh, top one hundreds, and also don't forget that you are gonna get your CE credits, and you will find them the information of how to get it in the comment parts on the face on the Facebook. Doctors, thank you very much. Nice to see you. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.